All right, guys. All right, guys. How's everything doing? Okay. Remember, it may take a few minutes for the internet to be strong, and we're trusting Jesus Christ, our God and Savior, to keep the internet strong and prevent it from buffering so yesterday you saw it buffered but then the buffering went away so i'm connected to the modem <clears throat> i don't have the internet on okay so let's trust the lord jesus that he'll bless this session as well and guys do me a favor please keep your questions related to the topic no side issues and debates i want us to focus you'll see why this is important in a minute i have articles to give you again for you to study at your own leisure to study these issues. Let me see. Should I put the camera? Yeah, okay. Ah, yeah, yeah. You can see my beautiful bald head, man. Look at that. What about your friends? Don't worry. I'm going to get my muscles back. I promise you. Don't hate. Don't hate. Let's see. Hold on. Let me see this. Oh, wait. Yeah, see, this is the one that's not that because I haven't been in the gym yet, but this you can see genetically. Oh, in the manger, the poor big Chuck Norris. Ah, huh? why, you little sucker. You know, Bruce Lee will do a Chuck Norris. I didn't see the debate. Let's not turn into an atheist versus Christian debate. But those of you who saw the debate, uh, Christ Almighty, I used to be in martial arts and wanted to be a martial artist, bodybuilder. That was in the 90s. Oh, the, by the way, guys, just to let you know a little bit about my martial arts background. What's up, A-D-A, dizzy, dizzy, bitty. What is it about? All right. We're going to wait a few minutes. We'll begin in prayer. Ask Holy Spirit to take over. I promise you, you're going to be blessed again and challenged, perhaps even upset, because we're talking about which Bible, the canon of the Holy Bible. And so be patient with me. Hear me out. Take what I have to say. Study it and trust Holy Spirit to guide you in all truth. So this is what I want you to pray. First, here's how I want you to pray. I want you to listen. First, pray the Holy Spirit. To fill us, seal us, transform us, purify us in the blood of Jesus Christ, to give us power to die to the flesh, to crucify, crucify the flesh, not succumb to the flesh, and have mercy on us when we do fail, and give us the strength to get back up, to become more like Jesus Christ, to love Jesus Christ, worship Jesus Christ, and live for him. That's first. Secondly, ask the Holy Spirit to give us the grace not to despair and not to shame the name of Jesus Christ. Because as the government starts scaring people, people are starting to lose control and panic. I've been telling you guys that be prepared because the government is going to tell people to stay home. Lock them in their homes for a while. It's starting because if you listen to Donald Trump's speech today, he's saying he doesn't want people to gather if there's more than 10. You understand what's happening? They're slowly getting you ready to lock yourself in your home. But if you love Jesus Christ and you know he's real, do not panic, do not despair, do not freak out and shame the name of Jesus Christ. Because if the unbelievers see that Christians are panicking, then what does that say about our confidence in Jesus? And why should they trust in Jesus when even his followers don't trust them enough to watch over them? Okay, you with me there? So remember, Jesus is alive. Jesus is real. He is almighty. He will protect you and give you grace to endure. Don't shame him. Don't shame him. If you stay home, take that as an opportunity to pray more, to worship him more, study your Bible more, right? And get online and read articles more. Take it as a time. Imagine you're in a monastery in a cave somewhere, and it's just you and Jesus. And thank God you got internet. At least you can fellowship and interact with people all over the world. Don't despair. Don't shame the name of Jesus Christ. This is the second thing, right? Please. Be filled with the joy of the Lord Jesus Christ. Be excited, right? I'm joyful, man. I'm joyful because you know why? I know Jesus will purify me, forgive me when I fail, and give me the grace to live for him, and he's with me. Look, do you know what's the worst case scenario? Let me give you the worst case scenario for a believer. You die and go to be with Jesus. Is that really bad? Because death 
is not the end of us. Christ is alive. We will enter his presence and there'll be no more pain, suffering, death, and misery. Honestly, he's real. Christ is alive. So don't shame him, please. And I say that as a reminder to myself. Trust in him. Trust his word. This is now a test of your faith. In Jesus' name, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name. As I said, the internet, it'll take a few more moments. Yeah, it's okay. It's going to take a few more. Don't panic. Like yesterday, it'll take maybe 15 minutes. It'll be okay. The internet's going to get good. Don't worry about it. That's how it is. Right? Okay? So just be patient. Like I said, let's trust in Jesus. This is now a test of our faith. Okay? This is where the rubber meets the road. Are we lip service or do we truly believe in him and rest in him? So by the grace and mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah, it's going to buffer a couple more times. I know it. But let's be patient. Like yesterday, the internet is much better. It's 99% better than it used to be. Because it's now connected directly to the modem and it's Ethernet. And I'm expecting when more people stay home, the internet's going to get worse. Because too much traffic. But hey, that's okay. Just uh, That's the second thing. Third thing I want you to pray about. Ask the Holy Spirit to guide you into all truth. To save you from any error from anyone that speaks, especially me. And I'm asking the Holy Spirit to prevent me from making mistakes. Save me from error. Right? And if there's something that I believe that's wrong, correct it in me not to teach it. So pray that for yourself. Holy Spirit, Sam, David Wood, they are imperfect human vessels. They don't know everything. And not everything they say is right. You are perfect. You are almighty. And you are the one who guides us into all truth and correct us when we're wrong and perfect us to be like, like Jesus. Show me where Sam is wrong and protect me from any error from Sam and show Sam where he's wrong. And the Holy Spirit will do wonders in and through you. Okay? So I just want you to keep this in mind. Okay? Now I have articles to go with these sessions. Isn't it amazing? Every time. Uh oh <laughs> my brother is is uh my brother pray for my brother Celine. Don't panic. Don't panic, bro. Don't panic. It's gonna be okay. Don't panic, man. Don't panic. The connection's gonna be all right. Let me just make sure I turn off here. I've noticed every time I touch my phone, something happens. Okay, anyway. Pray. Yeah, I'm gonna put my phone away. Okay. No, it's not. I turned it off. But anyway, don't panic. Yeah, see, I can see it slowing down because I think it's traffic. There's a lot of traffic, but don't worry, let's trust the Lord. His will be done. He doesn't need me. I need him. Okay. Pray for my brother, Sal. He's coming at the end of the month because he's going to be living with me. He's going to be my roommate. Pray God will provide for him, watch over him, and open the doors for him to get here because he's going to be driving. Okay? I am the youngest of six. His name is Sal. And pray for my family members that they come to know Jesus Christ and give their life to Jesus Christ and live for Jesus Christ. Right? Pray for that. And you know to pray for my daughters, my angels on earth, and their mother. Pray for their mother as well. God will convict her to see what's happening, and she needs to be ready and give her life to Jesus. If she does, then by the grace of God, we can work together as brother and sister, serving the Lord and raising these girls for the love of Jesus. Now, with that said, my brother is freaking out because everything I've told him is happening. Remember I told you guys last week, because I'm not a prophet, but it's obvious what we're doing. I told you that the government is preparing you. Slowly but surely, so you don't freak out, to keep you indoors. Remember I said that? It's on, it's, in fact, it's on my YouTube session. So I kept telling him, hey, this is what's happening. And there's someone, a brother in Christ, who keeps me up to date. He's in the know. He sends me every morning text messages, and he tells me this is what's up. And it happens. So I just told my brother, they're going to be closing down the health club because my brother is a bodybuilder. He's still, he's like 53, but he's all muscle. Got a little belly, belly but he's muscle. And he just sent me a message where the health club sent him a note, a text message, and said, we're closing shop for now. You get it? And he's like freaking out. He thinks like I'm probably working for the government. I'm a secret agent. How in the world do I know all this stuff? And speaking of martial arts, we're going to begin in a minute. I'm just waiting for it to warm up. Speaking of martial arts. I've told you I used to work out and I used to do martial arts. I haven't been in the gym for a while, but glory to God, he's helped me not to gain weight. Okay, now, how many how many of you guys have heard of the style Taekwondo? Taekwondo. Huh? Jumbi, 
Jikiriki. Hana, tu. Hana, tu. Come on, ladies. I'm single. You want to mingle? Looking for a godly woman who loves Jesus? That's a model. I can only date models. Just kidding. Oh, come on. Now. All right. How many of you have heard Tang Sodo? Tang Sodo. And hey, brothers, if you love Jesus and you got a beautiful sister that loves the Lord, like she's dropped dead gorgeous, send her my way so I can marry her tomorrow. And so we can increase the population with more of my seed. Now I'm playing. All right. No, I'm just kidding. All right. How many of you have heard of Tang Sodo? Tang Sodo. That's also a Korean martial art. In fact, Chuck Norris's system was Tang Sodo. See? Now, this is something that many people don't know about me. But I trust you guys because, you know, you come here. Did you know, before I got into the faith, I actually got as high as a fifth-degree black belt in one system. And in one system, I actually got level grandmaster. You guys want to hear what systems? I, be, I got a fifth-degree black belt. Honestly, you guys ready? Two systems. One system, I reached the level of grandmaster. Honestly. I became so good in two systems. I was a fifth-degree black belt in take one to go, and I became a grandmaster in take your dough. Fifth-degree, take one to go, and grandmaster in take your dough. Yeah! Hey, brother, what you going to do, man? What I'm that's right, man. <laughs> Sharia mania, brother. All right. Yep. Take one to take one to go, and take your dough. Don't tell anybody. All right. Now for the articles. You ready? Now for the articles. Are you ready for the articles? Uh -huh. All right, here's the link to a multi-part series. Now, here's the thing before I even give you this article. Okay, let me let me explain my position. All right, before I give you the article, remember I've been raised in a Protestant background and a Protestant tradition, which is ironic because the church of my parents and the church of my ancestors, it's not Protestant. It's called the Assyrian Catholicos Church of the East. Now, I need you guys to listen here. Now, this is where we're going to get into the meat. The Assyrian Apostolic Catholicos Church of the East, typically referred to as <clears throat> the Nestorian Church. However, the Assyrian Church has historically, and we have creeds, statements from their theologians in the 6th century, affirming Christ is one eternal divine person who took on a human nature from his blessed mother. <clears throat> Everyone listening now? <clears throat> okay. So they don't believe there was a divine Christ and a human Jesus that united. Okay. Now, so this is the church of my ancestors, my parents. I was baptized as a baby in this church. However, I wasn't raised in the church. <clears throat> so I don't know much about the church's theology. I don't know much about its unique doctrines. You know, I know here and there, but I'm not qualified to speak about it. Neither am I qualified to talk about the Coptic church, nor am I qualified to talk about the Orthodox church, nor am I even qualified to talk about Roman Catholicism, though I know Roman Catholicism a little better than I know my own church, the church of my ancestors, or the Coptic church, or the Orthodox church, the Orthodox tradition. So... I am not qualified to be addressing these issues because I haven't spent time addressing the issues. The only reason why I know Catholicism a little more is because over the years, I've watched Protestant and Catholic apologists debating, <clears throat> specifically Dr. James R. White, right? In the early years, in the 90s and the early 2000s, most of his debates were with Roman Catholics and Mormons. Roman Catholics and Mormons. And another gentleman that I used to watch debate was named Rob Zins. So I picked up on Catholic teaching from these debates. And then I would go to the Roman Catholic websites and to see what they had to say. But I'm still not an expert. Okay. I am not an expert. 
But I do know Catholics a little better than I know about Orthodox, the Nestorian Church, the Church of my ancestors, and the Coptic Church. Now, why am I saying this? I'm not trying to bore you because I'm trying to let you know. My upbringing has been in the Protestant tradition. Part of my tradition has been to reject what's known as the Jewish Apocrypha, also called by Catholics the Deuterocanonical Writings. Guys, I need you to listen here because you're going to learn, especially if you're evangelical or if you're a Baptist. You may know this, you may not know this. The Orthodox Church, especially the Ethiopian Orthodox Church, the Coptic Church, and the Catholic Church have more books in the Old Testament than the Protestants do. In fact, not only do they have more books in the Old Testament than the Protestants do, but even the Ethiopian Orthodox Church have even more books in their New Testament. In their New Testament. The Ethiopian Bible consists of 81 books. Some of the books that they include in the New Testament would be the Didache and the, the letter by Clement of Rome. Right? Of all the traditions, from what I know thus far, there may be some other church that I'm not aware of, the Ethiopian Orthodox Church has the largest canon among all the churches. In fact, first and last, do you have the link? The link to the Ethiopian Orthodox Church listing all the books they include in their canon? If you do, can you post it for us, brother? Okay. Okay. So, the Roman Catholic Church has 73 books in the Bible. <clears throat> they have more books in their Old Testament than the Protestants do. The Orthodox Church has more books than the Roman Catholic, but less than the Ethiopian Orthodox Church. And there are Orthodox Christians here that confirm what I'm saying, right? Oro and Anna and others that can confirm that. You have additional books in the Old Testament that even the Roman Catholics do, but you don't have as many books as the Ethiopian Orthodox Church does, right? Again, thank God that they're here. They can correct me if I'm wrong because I don't want to give you misinformation. But I just want to hear from them, from our Orthodox brothers and sisters in Christ. You guys right? Are you listening? Or, I, or did I just like you zone out and put you to sleep? First and last. So is that... The Ethiopian church, right? Okay. Okay. So the Orthodox are saying yes? Oh, you did? Post it again, and I didn't see it. So altogether, you have 76. The Orthodox church, when I say Orthodox church, I'm, I'm saying the Greek, the Russian Orthodox churches have 76. The Roman Catholics have 73. The Ethiopian Orthodox church, 81. The Protestants have 66. Now, I don't want to confuse any of you. Even though these traditions have more books than in the Protestant Bible, we all agree on 66 of those books. Guys, pay attention, please. I really need you to listen. You're going to have to learn because this is your tradition. This is your faith. Okay? We all agree on 66 of those books. Roman Catholics, Orthodox, and their various flavors of Orthodox, Protestants, all except 39 Old Testament books. Roman Catholic, the various flavors of Orthodoxy, Protestants, all except 27 New Testament books. Okay? Are you with me there? So even the Armenian Church, brother? I didn't know that. See, but they, they have 81 books too? All right. So it's still 81, though, Mr. 0022. I don't know why you have that name. Yeah. All right, sorry. The, the connection is getting good in Jesus' name. So the Armenian Church has 76. All right. Now, faith, focus, guys, and trust the Holy Spirit to bless. In fact, let me just ask the Holy Spirit to bless. Father, please, we ask you, as you always bless these sessions and always show up in your love and compassion and mercy for the sake of your Son, so that your son will be glorified. The Lord Jesus, your heart will be glorified. By the power of the Holy Spirit, take over this session. Take over my mouth. Guide me to speak truth without error. And to never prostitute myself for fame or money, Father. Make me a man of holiness and purity and of integrity. Make us all, men and women, of holiness, 
of love, of devotion, intensely worshiping you and worshiping your son by the power of your Holy Spirit, that Jesus will increase in us and that we decrease. Cover us by the blood of Jesus. Purify us in the blood of Jesus. Cleanse us by the blood of the Lamb, the Lord Jesus, and our loved ones. Wash my daughters in the blood of Jesus. Fill them. Fill us with your Holy Spirit, Father. Fill my lungs and my chest and throat with the breath of life. And anoint me to speak truth without error. Recall all these facts correctly and to do it lovingly. Loving my brothers and sisters from all these various traditions. And fill them with wisdom and knowledge, understanding from your spirit, Father. Because it's your spirit who seals us, preserves us, perfects us, teaches us, and transforms us to delight your heart and to become more like Jesus. So we're trusting in your Holy Spirit. Please, Abba. And bless the internet connection, Abba. And bring these people to listen and benefit and save me from error, Abba. Because of Jesus, what he did for us, and because you've given us your spirit, we can call you Abba, the very word that Jesus called you. We can call you Babi, Baban, Baba, our daddy, because you love us, just like you love Jesus because of Jesus in us. And we thank you for that grace. We love you, Babi. We love you, Abba. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' almighty name. Okay. By the way, another note. Don't let the government cause you to go into panic and be afraid where you're going to get food from and how are you going to pay your bills. Trust in Jesus. And one thing I want to encourage you, and I pray God purify my motive, that I'm saying it sincerely for the glory of Christ. Usually when people go through a, tri a, 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 a trial, the first thing they cut back from is supporting the work of God, supporting their church or missionaries or apologists. That should be the last area that you come back from. Give more to God and cut out those areas that are unnecessary, but never cut back from glorifying God with your money and helping the advancement of the kingdom of Jesus Christ to spread. Just remember that. Because what happens usually in times of panic epidemic, Christians cut back on ministry and giving to the work of the Lord. No, you never cut back from God's work. It is God who supplies your needs. So this is a test. I will trust you, not just with my words, with my life, but my finances. So remember that. Just wanted to say that because it's going to happen inevitably. People are going to try to hoard money. But the more you hoard and the more you rob God, the less you'll be blessed with your needs. Just a fact. But now with that said, okay, follow with me what I just said. Follow with me what I just said. Roman Catholic the various Orthodox <clears throat> churches, Protestants all accept 39 Old Testament books. We all agree on the 39 Old Testament books. It's number one. Roman Catholics, Orthodox, Coptic, right? The Nestorian Church, the Church of My Ancestors, Protestant. Let me pull back. Not the Nestorian Church. Let me repeat. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for saving me from error. Okay. The Roman Catholic tradition, the various Orthodox traditions, the Coptic tradition, Nestorian, the Assyrian Church of the East, the Church of my ancestors, Protestants, we all agree on 39 Old Testament books. Roman Catholic tradition, the Orthodox tradition, various traditions of Orthodoxy, Coptic tradition, and the Protestant, various Protestant traditions and groups, we all agree on 27 New Testament books. Everyone with me there? I was reaching out for some. Everyone got that? So we all agree on 66 books of the Bible. We're all in agreement. But there is one tradition, one tradition that is apostolic and that it's ancient and traces its roots to the apostles of our Lord. The Church of My Ancestors, the Assyrian Apostolic Catholicos Church of the East, called the Nestorian Church. Historically, that church has only accepted 22 of the 27 books of the New Testament. That's why I stopped and I paused and I corrected myself. I don't know if even the Assyrians know this. You Assyrians that have been raised in the Church of the East, and I've been baptized in the Church of the East, of the 27 books of the New Testament, historically they've only recognized 22. 22. One of the books that they don't recognize and accept as scripture is the book of Revelation. Everyone with me there? So that means 
the church of the East, of my ancestors, if you mind, except 61 books that these other traditions acknowledge as scripture. Now, with that said, because my background, my background is Protestant. I come from a Protestant evangelical heritage. In fact, I used to go to independent fundamental King James only Baptist churches when I was young, right? I've written a series of articles in response to Muslims presenting a case for the 66 books of the Bible and why Protestants do not accept what is known as the Jewish Apocrypha or the Deuterocanonicals. And the Jewish Apocrypha and the Deuterocanonicals refer to the books such as Wisdom of Solomon, the Wisdom of Sirach, Ben Sirach, First and Second Maccabees, Tobit. So here again, it's not buffering, it's okay now, right? Here again is the link to my multi-part series that I wrote years ago, years ago, on why I accept the Protestant tradition that doesn't recognize the Apocrypha, the Deuterocanonicals. Everyone with me? Are you listening? Are you following with me? Now, that's part one. If you click on that link and save it, when you read to the end, it will give you the link to part two and part three in the addendum. Now, let me share something, though. Let me make it clear. Because we have Roman Catholics and Orthodox here that do accept them as Scripture. I'm at a point right now, look, I want you to hear, even though these articles, when I wrote them, I didn't accept the Apocrypha Scripture, and I made a case from the Protestant perspective, the Protestant case, why Protestants reject the Apocrypha. I'm at a point right now, I have no problem believing and accepting the Apocrypha Scripture. If it is, I'll accept it. If it's not, I'll continue <clears throat> affirming the 66 books as the inspired <clears throat> list that God has given the church and still view these apocryphal books as beneficial and giving us an idea of what the Jews before the time of Christ believed and how they live and how they interpreted the Old Testament. But let me repeat again. I'm at a point in my walk, if the apocrypha is scripture, I'll accept it. I have no problem. I don't care anymore. Okay. I don't care anymore. I could tell you 10 years ago, I would argue tooth and nail, the Jewish Apocrypha, 1st and 2nd Maccabees, cannot be scripture. Wisdom of Solomon cannot be scripture. No more. If the evidence is clear, it is scripture, I bow the knee to the Holy Spirit, and I accept any book the Holy Spirit has inspired through holy men that he's raised for the edification of the church. That's where I'm at. Are you with me there? Are you with me there? You know why? I don't care what the truth is. I want to know what the truth is. When I say I don't care what it is, meaning if the Apocrypha Scripture, I'd have no reason to reject it. I want to know what the truth is. That's what I meant when I said I don't care. Whatever the truth is, even if it's something that goes against what I believe, I begged Holy Spirit to reveal that truth to me and give me the grace to accept it because I want to be a biblicist and accept all God's truth and not insist that my understanding or tradition is right. That's been my prayer, and I mean that from my heart. I lost already six minutes. Wow, we were 118. I lost people. See, I told you I'm going to lose some people. All right? We went from 118 to 112. That's all right. Hopefully we get to 200. Okay, so here's the link to part one. But now I got some other articles for you. Here is the article that I'll be using to refute Ahmadidat. Now that with that said as a background, I'm going to explain what the issues are. I'm going to explain what the issues are. Okay. What are the issues? What are the issues? Okay. Why did I title it Ahmadidat refuted which Bible? Because one of the common objections by Mohammedan apologists such as the late Ahmadidat and others like Shabir Ali or even someone like Jamal Badawi. If you're in Christian 
ministry to Muslims, you know these names. If you have been interacting with Muslims for years, especially on social media, you know Jamal Barawi. You know Ahmad Didat. You know Zakir Naik, one of Islam's greatest clowns. Shibra Ali, Adnan Rashid, so on and so forth. Mohammedans who follow the same spirit that possessed their prophet, the spirit who's the father of lies and a murderer, whose goal is to destroy the faith of Christians and the true word of God, the Bible, and the true God of the Bible. Now, how many of you know that Ahmad Didat debated Pastor Jimmy Swaggart in the 80s? Jimmy Swaggart, one of the most famous Pastors of the 80s, one of the most dynamic, dynamic evangelical pastors and preachers of the 80s, a pastor of the Assemblies of God, debated Ahmad Didat. And that debate made Ahmad Didat infamous all over the world. He became a celebrity because the Muslims felt that Ahmad Didat demolished Jimmy Swagger. And you can watch that debate on YouTube. Let me get you the link. Can someone get the link? One of the mods, get the link. Wow, we went from 118, 106. Guys, I didn't know the Apocrypha would upset you or bore you. Jimmy Spaggart was one of the most popular pastors, televangelists, preachers of the 80s. He was a big name, powerful, charismatic preacher. And so the Muslims wanted to take him on because if you take one of the most, if not the most, televangelists, and you refute him, then that makes you a celebrity in the Muslim world. This debate was so influential that it was aired in Muslim countries and dubbed in Arabic, Arabic subtitles. Okay, now first last posted the link. Riaz posted the link. I highly encourage you to listen to the debate because the debate is, is the Bible God's word? Now notice, how much of a coward, a demon, a Satan, Didat was. He didn't debate him is the Quran the word of God. He debated him is the Bible the word of God. As if the Quran wins by default. That if you refute the Bible, that means the Quran is true. And this is why I have no respect for these Mohammedan cowards. Rarely, if at all, will they debate is the Quran the word of God. Often, they will demand that they debate two topics in one. The Bible or the Quran. But if you try to get someone snake like Shabra Ali, let's just debate, is the Quran the word of God? He will refuse because he wants to bring in the Bible so he can spend most of his time attacking the Bible in order to deceive people into thinking the Quran wins by default. Right? Okay, so now with that said, what was his objection? To show Muslims... Don't even consider Christianity because Christianity is a house of cards. It's a house built on sand. And even Christians do not know, cannot decide what the word of God is. And his hope was that he would also get Christians to start doubting. Wait, hold on. If the Catholics have 73 books, Protestants have 66, who's right? Okay, so here's the link. I wrote a link refuting him and showing him that as a Muslim, as a Muslim, he should know the answer. There he goes. That's the link. Save that article. Click on it and save it. So in the debate, he would pick up the Dewey Reims Catholic Bible. It's in the debate, by the way. I'm not making it up. He would pick up the King James Bible. He'd pick up the Revised Standard Version of the Bible. And he'd pick up the Dewey Reims Bible. On stage, he'd have all three Bibles. Are you listening here? Invite people. Come on now. What happened? We went, one, oh, you guys, I'm losing you guys. Oh, my goodness. That means David would always outnumber me, even though he puts people to sleep. Okay. And the debate on stage, he'd pick up the King James Bible, the Dewey Reims Bible, and the Revised Standard Version of the Bible. And he would say, which one of these are the Word of God? The Dewey Rames has 73 books. The King James has 66 books, as does the Revised Standard version, version. Which one of these are the Word of God? Either one of you added to God's Word or subtracted. 
Either one of you add it to God's word or subtract it. Are you with me there? That was his objection. Now, if you're dealing with Muslims, I'm going to teach you how to respond to a Muslim and show the Muslim what the answer is for him. And this is where there's going to be a difference of opinion. What do I mean? Among Christians of the various denominations and stripes, we can agree to disagree and passionately debate the issue. I can debate with a Roman Catholic whether the Apocrypha should be part of the Old Testament or not, right? But we still agree 66 of those books are the inspired, inerrant, infallible word of God, right? For a Muslim, however, for a Muslim, the Quran already settles the debate for him. Are you ready now? I'm showing you how to refute a Muslim. Once you get rid of the Muslim objection, then we Christians can debate that issue among ourselves in a spirit of love where we don't condemn the other who disagrees with our canon as being a false Christian. Can I repeat that again? Can I repeat that again? I'm going to show you how to refute this Muslim objection, to silence the Muslim, to never ever bring up this objection if he's honest to the Quran, if she's honest to the Quran. And once you get rid of the Muslim objection, then we can focus on each other. I can now engage Orthodox or Roman Catholics or Coptic, and we can have passionate <clears throat> debates in a spirit of love to see whether the Apocrypha is scripture or not without condemning the opposing view as necessarily damnable heresy or those who disagree with me as false Christians. Is that clear? I know there are Protestants who think if you accept the Apocrypha, then you've perverted the word of God, you're not a Christian. And I know there are Orthodox who think if you reject the Apocrypha, then you're not a Christian. And Catholics who think if you reject it, you're not. See, we have people in our camps that will condemn the other as being heretics, schismatics, who have corrupted the word of God. I'm not one of them. If you believe in the ap Apocrypha, that doesn't automatically mean to me you're not a Christian. Because you have people born of the Spirit who belong to Jesus Christ in all these major branches of Christianity who may disagree regarding the canon, but still belong to Jesus, are loved by Jesus, are covered by the blood of Jesus and sealed by the Spirit for the day of glory. That's my belief. You disagree with me? Then maybe you shouldn't be here. You should go somewhere else. Whether you're Protestant or Roman Catholic or Orthodox or Coptic, if you disagree with me, then this channel is not for you. That's my conviction. And if I'm wrong, God have mercy on me. That's what I believe. That's my conviction. I'm not saying I'm right. I'm trusting the Spirit to show me where I'm wrong and to strengthen me in the truth that he's made known to me for the glory of Jesus. Okay, so if we got that, can I now show you how to silence a Muslim if he ever brings this objection up? But you're going to have to click on that link. Save that article, study it, and use it. And I don't know if we'll be able to quote. Can you? I don't think they're going to be able to quote the passages from there. All right, here you go. Okay. Yeah, I don't think, uh, yeah, it's going to be too long. All right, guys, what I'm going to do, and here, do me a favor first, last. If I start buffering, just text me on my phone because I'm going to have to read from my article. The passages are too long to quote, okay? So just text me and say, hey. Say, hey, you're buffering. Because I won't be able to, because I got to read, okay? Click on it because these passages are too long to co copy and paste. So sorry about that, right? Sorry about that. I promise you, if you have an open heart and mind and listen, you're going to learn, even in, in those areas that you disagree with me. Yeah, Shibra Ali is light years ahead of Ahmad Didat. Shibra Ali is light years ahead of Ahmad Didat. Ahmad Didat was a joke, as is Zakir Naik, right? All right, are we ready now? Here's the link. The answer to the Muslim is this. Here's the answer. If you believe in the Quran, and I pray you stop believing in the Quran, 
and condemn Muhammad as an antichrist and start worshiping Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. But if you believe the Quran, the Quran tells you, if you want to know the canon of the Hebrew Bible, because where are the differences, folk? The difference between the Roman Catholic Protestant has to do with the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, not the New Testament. Roman Catholics, Protestant, we all accept the 27 books of the New Testament. The, dip, the debate, the difference is the Old Testament. For a Muslim, if he or she wants to know what the canon of the Hebrew Bible is, what the canon of the Old Testament is, the Quran tells the Muslim to ask the Jews, the Yahud, Bani Israel, not the Christians. Did you get the answer or no? Let me repeat the answer, then I'm going to give you the verses. The Quran says to the Muslims, the Old Testament, the Tanakh, it doesn't use the word Tanakh, the Torah, the, the Zabur, were entrusted to the Yahud, the Jews, Bani Israel. Ask them what books were given to them by God. So the debate between Catholics and Protestants shouldn't affect the Muslim understanding of what books God inspired as part of the Old Testament because they're told to go to the Jews for the answer, not to the Christians. Everyone got it? Before I move on? Did you get it? Because I'm going to give you the proof. If you didn't get it, let, ask me so I can repeat, because now I got to read the verses. They're too long. We can't copy and paste. So here is the link. Save it. All that's there. Let's start reading. Okay. I'm going to try to work my way down and up. Guys, let me know when I'm buffering. Okay. The Quran clearly says that the Old Testament, the revelation of Moses, right? The writings of the prophets were entrusted to the children of Israel, to the Jews. Let's start reading. I'm going to start reading with you for you guys, right? It's all in my article. Chapter 17, verse 2 of the Quran. Chapter 17, verse 2. We gave Moses the book and made it a guide to the children of Israel. So, Didat, why are you asking me, a Christian, about the Old Testament? It says that the book of Moses was given to the children of Israel. We inherited it from them. Chapter 23, verse 49 of the Quran. And we gave Moses the book for Israel's guidance. For Israel's guidance. Oh, man. Chapter 29, verses 26 to 27. Chapter 29, verses 26 to 27. And by the way, if you're not able to keep up the verses, it's in the article. Chapter 29, verses 26 to 27. And Lot believed him and said, Lo, I am a fugitive unto my Lord. Lo, he, only he is the mighty, the wise. And we bestowed on him Isaac and Jacob, and we established the prophethood and the scripture among his seed, meaning the Israelites. And we gave him his reward in the world, and lo, in the hereafter, he verily is among the righteous. So the prophethood and the scripture were placed among the seed of Israel, the Israelites. Okay, chapter 40, verses 53 to 54. Chapter 40, verses 53 to 54. We did, after time, give Moses the book of guidance. And we gave the book in inheritance to the children of Israel. Moses' book we gave to the children of Israel as their inheritance. Now, before I read the rest, is it clear? Everyone getting it? God bless Protestants who's able to copy and paste it and do it. Did you guys get it so far? I still have a lot more. There's, I'm not done yet. Okay. Let's continue. <clears throat> Chapter 45, verse 16. I'm not going to read all of them. I'm going to read those where I think are just the strongest. 45, verse 16. Notice this. Indeed, we gave the children of Israel the book, the judgment, and the prophethood. And we provided them with good things, and we preferred them above all beings. Wow. This one I got to copy and paste. I think he did it too. Look how powerful this is. Look how powerful this is. 45, 16. There you go. Indeed, we gave the children of Israel the book. So we gave them the scripture. We gave them the judgment and the prophethood. 
and we provided them with good things and preferred them above all beings. Now, Ahmadidad, you wicked son of Satan, you're now under the feet of Jesus as your prophet has been under the feet of Jesus. Why would you bring up the difference between the Roman Catholic and Protestant Bible when you know the Quran says the Old Testament is given to the Jews and the Jews will settle it for you? Why did you do that? Do you see how wickedly dishonest, evil these Muslim apologists are? And their fruits testify what spirit inspires them, the same spirit that possessed their prophet, the spirit who's the father of lies and a murderer? Because if your Quran tells you the Old Testament was entrusted to the Jews, why then are you bringing up a Catholic, Roman Catholic Bible and a Protestant Bible to show that they disagree in the contents of the Old Testament when the Quran tells you you don't go to the Christians to know what the Old Testament is, you go to the Jews. Yes, he was, Thomas. And he was being dishonest and wickedly so. All right. On top of this, the Quran tells Muslims, if you want to know about the sacred history of Israel, you don't ask the Christians, you ask the Jews. Here, let me read it for you. Chapter 2, verse 211. Chapter 2, verse 211. Ask of the children of Israel how many a clear revelation we gave them. Who do you ask about Israel's sacred history? Christians or Jews? Here it goes. Chapter 2. Here you go. There it goes. Verse 211. Do you guys see it? Let me post it again. Ask of the children of Israel how many a clear revelation we gave them. So does it say, ask the Christians how many revelations we gave the Jews? Is that what it said? Or did it say Muslims? Ask the children of Israel how many revelations we gave them. So then Didat, why did you raise up a Dewey Rain Bible, Roman Catholic version of the Bible, and the King James Version, a Protestant version of the Bible, to try to pit Christians against each other when their difference has to do with the Old Testament. And the Quran tells you, if you want to know about the Old Testament, ask the Jews, ask the Israelites, not the Christians. What about chapter 17, verse 101? Here you go. Chapter 17, verse 101. You see how easy the triune God has made refuting Islam? He's made it so easy that it's a miracle people still believe in Islam. Okay? It's a miracle they still believe in it. Okay? 17, verse 101. And verily we gave unto Moses nine tokens, clear proofs of Allah's sovereignty. Do but ask the children of Israel when he came to them. Who do you ask? Muhammad, who do you ask? Do you ask the Christians or do you ask the children of Israel about the miracles, the signs that Moses brought? Do you ask the Christians about the revelations God gave to the Israelites or ask the Israelites? And even here you have an error. Even here, if they were to ask the Israelites, they would prove that Muhammad is a fraud. Because Muhammad says, Moses came with nine signs to Pharaoh. No, he didn't. He came with ten. The ten plagues. So even here it's wrong. And if the Quran says, go ask them. But hold on. Muhammad, if we ask them, they're going to say it's 10. How come you only have nine? Uh, Graham, you need to get out of here. The Israelites are the Jews, and the Jews are the Israelites, because it's talking about the Jews at Muhammad's day, and it's calling them the children of Israel. But you need to go. Get them out of here for being this stupid to try to posit a distinction between the Israelites and the Jews. Get out of here. Again, this is why I can't stand people like this at Pontificate. Muhammad is told, ask the children of Israel, according to this. See, again, I'm going to call a moron and stupid, and people are going to say, you're being mean. Who are the children of Israel at the time of Muhammad, if not the Jews? You see how stupid some people can be? It says, ask the children of Israel. How am I going to ask the children of Israel if there are no Israelites? And who are the Israelites at the time of Muhammad if they're not the Jews? And you wonder why I get upset, guys? You wonder why I'll never break the 200 mark? Because I don't tolerate idiocy and stupidity 
and ignoramuses who think they know what they're talking about? You see why I won't be invited to the big conferences, but I'll be locked in my house by myself, quarantined, whereas the government will give you permission to leave your house. They're going to lock me in indefinitely until Jesus takes me home. Okay. All right. Do you see what the Quran says? Who to ask? Let me give you a few more verses. And then we're going to talk about the Apocrypha among Christians. Among Christians. Okay. Among us. Now that we've destroyed this canard of Gidat, let me show you what the Quran says to the Jews. To the Jews of Muhammad's day. Let me go to chapter 4, verses 46 to 47. Of the Jews, there are those, chapter 4, verses 46 to 47. Of the Jews, there are those who displace words from the right places and say, we hear and we disobey. And hear what is not heard. And ra'ina, ra'ina, with the twist, twist of their tongues and slander to faith. If only they had said what we hear and we obey and do hear. And do look at us. Give us attention, Muhammad. If only the Jews of Muhammad's day said that to Muhammad. Now here's where I need you guys to listen. It would have been better for them and more proper, but God hath cursed them for their unbelief, and but few of them will believe. O ye people of the book, O ye people of the book, context the Jews, believe in what we have now revealed, confirming what is already with you. Confirming what is with you. Okay, help me out, guys. I'm not the sharpest tool in the shed. Muhammad is told by that spirit that deceived him, tell the Jews, tell the Jews, that this Quran confirms what they have. Guys, help me understand because I'm not the sharpest tool in the, sh in the shed. Neither is Protestant believer. If the Quran is confirming what the Jews possessed in their hands at the time of Muhammad, that means whatever book they believed was scripture is scripture as far as the Quran is concerned. That means a Muslim has to ask the question historically at the time of Muhammad. Pay attention here. Historically, at the time of Muhammad, when Muhammad preached to the Jews, how many books did the Jews accept as scripture? How many books made up their Old Testament at the time of Muhammad? And historically, we know. There are even Muslims who mention the books of the Jews at that time, who have a list saying the Jews believe in these books. Historically, the Jews at the time of Muhammad... Yeah. Sorry about that. This is just a fact of history. Sorry, don't get panicked. It's going to buff for a few minutes. Okay. Yeah, in Jesus' name, please, Lord. I saw it. Okay. Historically, this is just a fact of history. During the time of Muhammad in the 600s, the Jews at the time of Muhammad, both near Muhammad and the world over, only accepted 39 Old Testament books. Therefore, if you're a Muslim, how many books are you supposed to recognize as being part of the revelation given to the Jews? If you are a Muslim, not that about a Christian. If you are a Muslim, how many books does the Quran tell you to recognize as part of the revelation given to the Jews? How many? Help me out, guys. Exactly. Not, I don't know. I wouldn't be surprised if they did. It's the list of the books of the Jews at time Muhammad or sometime after his death is given in a Muslim catalog, catalog called El Fihrist. El Fihrist, which I quote. But anyway. Thomas, don't get into side issues, my friend. Focus with me, Thomas. Let's see if you're getting it. If the Quran, speaking to the Jews of Muhammad's day, says, this Quran confirms what you have. And just on historical and textual grounds, you can demonstrate historically, textually, that the Jews at that time only recognized 39 Old Testament books. Then whether the Muslims mention the books or not, irrelevant to the issue at hand. This is an issue of history. And the history shows the Jews at the time of Muhammad, 7th century AD, 
only recognize the 39 Old Testament books that Protestants only accept as the books that God gave to the children of Israel. Therefore, from the Muslim perspective, I'm, I'm sounding like a broken record. From the Muslim perspective, this case has been settled for the Muslim. You ask the Jews, the Jews at Muhammad's time, hey, what are the revelations that Allah gave you? These 39 Old Testament books. These are the books that we accept that Allah sent down. And Muhammad says, well, I confirm those books. My Quran and I confirm the books you have. Thank you, Benjamin. God bless you. God bless you, Benjamin. Thank you for your support. Thank you all. Thank you also for the brother that supported. Okay, everyone with me there? El Fihrist is the English title. El Fihrist. By the way, let me know, thou shalt not pontificate, if the people on Discord are following with me, especially daughter of Christ. El Fihrist, and if she's getting it. Because I want her to use it as ammunition in her witness. Okay, everyone with me? You got it? Okay. Let me just read one more citation. Now we're going to talk among Christians. <laughs> among Christians, all right? Chapter 2, verses 40 to 44 and 47. This will be it. I got more verses, but let me give you the link again. And at the bottom of this post... I have links to other articles for you to study with greater depth. So click on the links, save the articles, study them, pass them on, disseminate this information for the glory of the triune God. Okay? Okay, now, chapter 2 of the Quran, verses 40 to 44 and 47. Let me read. Let me know if I'm buffering on the phone because I won't see it now. And then we won't need the article anymore. O children of Israel, ya ben Israel, but according to our friend, Graham Cracker, I don't know if the children of Israel are the same thing as the Jews. Even though Muhammad is addressing the Jews, and the only children of Israel would be the Jews that he's speaking to, I don't know if that's the case. Get out of here, dude. Be thankful that God doesn't give us permission to beat people into repentance and beat the stupid out of them. I don't know. Hey, brother, what you going to do, man? All right. I'm dangerous, bro. Look at this. I am a real Assyrian. Fight for the rights of Lebanon. Yeah, all right. Come on, woman. Look at that. Look at that, ladies, man. I'm just one gorgeous hunk of Assyrian. Yeah, okay. Let's continue. Chapter 2, verses 40 to 44 and verse 47. O children of Israel, remember my favor wherewith I favored you and fulfill your part of the covenant. I shall fulfill my part of the covenant. Pay attention, speaking to the Jews at Muhammad's time and believe in that which I reveal, meaning the Quran, confirming that which he possess already of the scripture. Hear me and believe in that which I reveal, confirming that which ye possess already of the scripture. Uh, Ahmadidat? Yes. This is at the time of your prophet, right? Yes. And so who's your prophet talking to? Oh, the Jews. So is it saying that this Quran confirms the scriptures they have, not the Christians? Not the Old Testament of the Christians? Yes. Uh Ahmad Dida, you are aware that historically at that time they only accepted 39 Old Testament books, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah uh, uh. Oh, and then he's going to start chanting the Quran. Okay, let's finish. And be not the first to disbelieve therein, and part not with my revelations for a trifling price. And keep your duty unto me. Confound not truth with falsehood, nor knowingly conceal the truth. Guys, uh, help me understand. I'm a little challenged. The Quran says, do not conceal the truth. Okay, help me understand. Help me understand. How can the Jews of Muhammad's time conceal the truth if they didn't have the truth? You can't hide something that you don't have. Let's post it again. 
You can't hide something you don't have, right? You with me there? Who's not getting it? Let's let me post it again. Confound not the truth of falsehood, nor knowingly conceal the truth. How can Muhammad say, don't conceal the truth if they didn't have the truth? It was perverted and corrupted, so they didn't know what was the, what was true anymore. So much for the Muslims who say the Quran doesn't confirm the Bible. No, never, never, no, 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 no. All right, let me finish it. Establish worship, pay the poor due, and bow your heads with those who bow in worship. Enjoin ye righteousness upon mankind while ye yourselves forget to practice it. So you tell people to be righteous, but then you're unrighteous, you hypocrites. And you are readers of the scripture. Have ye then no sense? Okay, now, guys, again, help me. Remember, I'm a little mentally challenged. The end part of 44, notice what it says. And you are readers of the scripture. Have ye then no sense? How can they be reading a scripture that no longer exists? And why would Muhammad rebuke them? For failing to live up to the scripture they read if their scripture was corrupted and unreliable. Let me post it again. Let me repeat the question. Anna and everyone else, I hope you're benefiting from this. How can Muhammad condemn the Jews for reading a scripture that they didn't have? And why would they be condemned for not living up to a scripture if their scripture was corrupted and unreliable? You get it now? You see how easy it is to expose Muhammad and destroy Islam and destroy the Quran and show these are the work of Satan and that Jesus has conquered Muhammad and Muhammad is under the holy feet of Jesus, under his wrath. If you know the arguments. Now, the final verse is 47 because this one I wanted to show you. 247. Okay, watch here. Chapter 2, verse 47. O oh, children of Israel, remember my favor way wherewith I favored you and how I preferred you to all creatures. My goodness, the Quran says, of all peoples, Allah preferred, favored the Israelites above all creatures. Did I make the case? Is it clear now? That the Quran already answers this challenge that these Mohammedans deceitfully, wickedly, dishonestly use. As far as the Quran is concerned, as far as the Muslims are concerned, they've been told. They've been told. You want to know what the Old Testament is? Ask the Jews. Case closed. So why are you now using this in debate? You wicked, dishonest, deceitful Mohammedan. Clear? Is that clear? Because now I want to turn our attention to us Christians. I want to turn our, our attention to us Christians. We now took care of that. You got the article. Now let's talk about our differences. I gave you the link to my article giving you the Protestant perspective. Why the Protestant Bible agrees with the Jews, and only accepts 39 Old Testament books. However, I want you to also read the other perspectives. And I think Anna may have links. I know Roman Catholic apologists have written books, and they have videos, and they have articles discussing why they believe these Jewish deuterocanonical writings, apocryphal writings, are scripture. You need to hear all sides and come to your own conclusion. Now, what I'm going to do here, I'm going to show you some stuff that argues for the canonicity of the Jewish Apocrypha and arguments against the canonicity of the Apocrypha. I'm going to give you two perspectives, some arguments that seem to suggest these Jewish books that the Jews themselves have rejected at least after the time of Christ, right? And which Protestants reject. <clears throat> maybe scripture after all, but then arguments showing maybe they're not scripture and shouldn't be part of the canon. Okay? Are you ready? I don't know what that last... 
Kareem Abdullah, which one's good? The one there are, I showed that your Quran says that you have to follow the Jewish canon, whatever books the Jews at the time Muhammad believed and accepted. Okay, so are you ready now? Are you ready now? I'm going to read this. We're not posting this. If you're ready, let me know. Get ready now. Let me blow you. And the Protestants are going to get blown away with this. You ready? Now, for those of you who have been following me, or those of you who know where this is from, don't chime in. Those who are hearing it for the first time, I want you to chime in. Because many brothers, sisters have already know these issues or have been with me for years and have heard me bring up these issues. Don't chime in. Let the newbies respond. Okay. Let me know, guys, if I'm buffering because I'm going to read. I'm looking at my phone. Let me know. You ready? Okay, let's begin, gentlemen. Let the tournaments begin. Da -da -da. All right. Let me read. Let us lie and wait for the righteous man. Guys, pay attention. Let us lie and wait for the righteous man. Because he is inconvenient to us and opposes our actions. He reproaches us for, our, for sins against the law. He rebukes us for sinning against the law. And accuses us of sins against our training. Meaning we were trained in the way of Moses. But he rebukes us for failing to honor the commands of Moses. Accuses us of sins against our training. He professes to have knowledge of God. And calls himself a son of the Lord. He calls himself a son of the Lord. A child of the Lord. He became to us a reproof of our thoughts. He reproves us. He convicts us. He shames us. Right? The very sight of him is a burden to us. Oh, here he comes again, man. Darn it. Because his manner of life is unlike that of ours. And his ways are strange. Different from what we do, from our customs. They're strange. They're different. Pay attention. We are considered by him as something base. And he avoids our ways as unclean, that our ways are not righteous before God. He calls the last end of the righteous blessed. He says the, the end of the life of the righteous, they're blessed. They're happy. They're not cursed because they will be in the presence of God, basically. I'm giving a commentary here. He calls the last end of the righteous happy. And he boasts that God is his father. He boasts that God is his father. Let us see if his words are true. And let us test what will happen at the end of his life. For if the righteous man is God's son, if he's really God's child, God will help him and will deliver him from the hand of his adversaries. Let us test him with insult and torture. Let us insult him and torture him so that we may find out how gentle he is and make trial of his patience. Test his patience, his forbearance. Let us condemn him to a shameful death. For according to what he says, he will be saved and protected. Who's this talking about? Who's this talking about? Who's this talking about? For those of you paying attention. Amazingly, right? An amazing prophecy of what they did to Jesus and what they said to him while he was hanging on the cross, right? Right? You know where that comes from? Let me give you the link. The Wisdom of Solomon, chapter 2, verses 11 to 20, in the Jewish Apocrypha. The Wisdom of Solomon, chapter 2, verses 11 to 20. It's from the Jewish Apocrypha that the Roman Catholic, the Orthodox traditions, the Coptic accept as Scripture. Wisdom, chapter 2, verses 11 to 20. Here's the link. Click on it and see the New Revised Standard Version. See, you guys are blown away, aren't you? You're like, wow. <whistles> what? I'm going to give you a minute for it to sink in. How many of you just got blown away? 
Well, it's attributed to Solomon. It's the wisdom of Solomon. So obviously, it's believed that Solomon wrote it, but what we have is a Greek version. So the Greek version is around the second century before Christ, right? Second century BC. But that's because it's the Greek version. But it's attributed to Solomon. Blown away? How many of you guys were blown away? Luisa, are you here? Marcy, Mary, are you the newbies? Brother made a good point. And I'll do the William Lane Craig impersonation at the end. By the way, thou, thou shalt not pontificate. The people in Discord, how did they react to that? Exactly, Luisa. Be open to the truth of God and accept whatever is true because God is truth and all truth is God's truth. Brother made a good point. Okay, I want to give it a minute to sink in. Okay, but now I got another one. A brother made a good point. I got another one. Are you ready for another one? Before I give you this other one, let's read Revelation 19, 11 to 16. Yeah, but remember, Candace, miracles in and of themselves do not prove something is from God. Okay, before we go to Revelation 19, hold on. Before you go to Revelation 19. So don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying Catholicism is necessarily false or true. What I'm saying is never point to miracles to prove something because Jesus told us that Satan and evil spirits will do miracles so convincing to deceive, to deceive the elect if it were possible. Okay, let me show you. Let me give you an example. Are you ready, Candace? He brought up a good point. Candace has said Catholics have a lot of miracles that are hard to deny. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. I'm not saying these miracles are not of God and they're of the evil one. Let me just repeat. God himself said miracles are not enough because Satan can do miracles. Evil spirits can do miracles to deceive you from the truth. A miracle is only true and from God if it agrees and confirms the revelations of God that has been established. Let me show you that from the Lord. Matthew 24, verses 23 to 25. What I'm going to do right now, Lisa, pay attention. Matthew 24, verses 23 to 25. But hold on, Mr. 00221. I'm going to give another side. I'm going to give you both sides. Let you decide for yourself. I report you decide. Now read, Candace, read. Then if any man should say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. For there shall arise false Christ and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders. They will do amazing, mind-blowing miracles. Insomuch that if it were possible that they shall deceive the very elect. Behold, I've told you before. Thank Jesus, it won't be possible to deceive the elect because the Holy Spirit will convict you, bring you to your senses, and preserve you. But notice what Jesus is saying. The miracles will be so amazing that even an elect will take back and say, whoa, wait, 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 whoa. What in the world was that? Oh, but wait, he's contradicting the message of Jesus. That's the devil, and I rebuke you in the name of Jesus, and you'll come back to your senses. So you see how amazing the Bible is? The Bible has all the answers and gives everything you need to protect yourself and not be deceived if you know the Bible. That's why even if someone raises a dead man, here, if a person is clinically dead, heartbeat stop, brain activity dead, and the man raises him in front of my eyes and says, Muhammad is the messenger of Allah, I'll say, you are a devil. That is a satanic miracle. I rebuke you in the name of Jesus because even a dead man who comes back to life will not convince me you have the truth because the Bible has been established. It is the word of God and Christ is risen, risen indeed. This is why don't be duped and swayed by miracles. Right? Bobby, yes, there are certain books in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Someone confirm this, please. Go to Sheikh Google. 
they found, I believe, a Hebrew version of the book of Sirach in the Dead Sea Scrolls. And they also found a section of the book of Enoch called the book of Watchers. Exactly, Tenshi. Revelation 13, the entire chapter. Let me give you another one. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses <clears throat> 9 to 12. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 9 to 12. I hope you're learning a lot. You're getting a lot of me. You're being strengthened in your faith, strengthened in the Bible, strengthened in the God of the Bible, and have no doubt you have the truth. That's why, shame on any of us. Shame on me. Shame on you if you panic. If the government says you stay indoors, you start panicking, shame on you and me if we panic. Shame on us. You got your Christian brothers and sisters who are in prison in China for 20 years, and what they do is they preach the gospel in prison, sing hallelujah to the Lord. They're not shaken. Don't you dare panic. Yep, that's Deuteronomy 13, verses 1 to 5, Thomas. Hold your horses. <clears throat> 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 9 to 12. Not everyone has that gift, Vivi. Some do, some don't, Vivi. 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 9 to 12. Who's posting? I thought Protestant was. I think he took a vacation. Okay, read. Yeah, the Alzheimer's is kicking in. I said 2 Thessalonians 2, 9 to 12. Protestant, I'm really scared, man. It's getting worse every day. Are you sure it's Alzheimer's and not coronavirus? 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 9 to 12. Second Thessalonians 2, verses 9 to 12. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan. Talking about the Antichrist, folks. The Antichrist will do miracles by whose power? Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan. All power and signs and lying wonders. Miracles to deceive you. To make you believe the lie. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish. Because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. So is it clear now? Revelation 13, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 9 to 12, Matthew 24, verses 22 to 25, and Deuteronomy 13, verses 1 to 5. Say, people will come, false prophets, false Christ. They will make accurate predictions. They will do miracles and signs, but it's by the power of Satan and evil spirits. And you'll know it's from Satan. If they contradict the Bible, if they preach a different gospel, if they preach a different Jesus, know that Satan trying to deceive you and you won't be deceived because you know the truth and the truth sets us free. Glory to the triumph God. Glory to our God for giving us his Bible, the truth, where we cannot be deceived or shaken. Amen? Yeah. And if you're amening and it's from your heart, don't you dare panic. If they say, stay in your house for two weeks, no work. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God in the storm. Eyes on Jesus, the same God who rained manna, a fact of history. He did it. Will rain manna on you. Trust, obey, and believe. And let me encourage you. Increase your prayers. Increase your fasting. Increase your study of the word. And increase your giving to the work of God, not decrease. And I'm not saying because I want your money. God forbid. But don't let this cause you to stumble and fall and hoard stuff. You don't need to hoard. I'm not saying be stupid. Yeah, get what you need. God wants you to be like the ant. Get the water you need, the food you need. But don't worry about running out. Jesus is alive. He's God over coronavirus and the government. But this is going to be a test of your faith now. Let's see. What kind of example are we going to be for the world? If they say, see Christians panic, you'll say, then why should I follow Jesus? Jesus isn't making any difference in their life. They're just as weird as I am. 
Shame on us if we shame the Lord Jesus. Shame on us. Okay? Right? So with that said, let's go to Revelation 19, 11, and 16. Revelation 19, 11, and 16. I want to show you something. Revelation 19, 11, and 16. Read now. Pay attention. Don't disgrace the name of Jesus. Revelation 19, 11, 16. Yes. Thank you, King of Kings. May the Lord help me to do that and practice what I preach. Reach out to the elderly. Help them. Do what you can to be Jesus to them. Revelation 19, 11 and 16. Read with me, folks. Thank you, Candence. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. Pay attention. The rider on the white horse. His name is Faithful and True. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knows knew, no man knew, but he himself. Guys, now read 13, please. I really need you to pay attention. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. Scroll back and read it. His name was called the Word of God. So Jesus is the rider on the white horse with a robe dipped in blood, the blood of his enemies, whose name is faithful and true because it says his name is the Word of God. The Word of God is not the Father. The Word of God is not the Holy Spirit. The Word of God is Jesus. So this is Jesus. Now pay attention to 14 and 16. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth, out of the mouth of Jesus, goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and treadeth, treads on the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture his robe, and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Now, follow me, guys. Jesus here has a sword that comes out of his mouth. It's a metaphorical sword. Jesus here is called the Word of God. Revelation 3, verse 21. Revelation 3, verse 21. Please pay attention for your benefit. Revelation 3, verse 21. Exactly, life is good. To him that, Jesus speaking, by the way, our Lord says, To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me, in my throne, even as I also ever came, I overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. So pay attention. Jesus sits on the throne with his father. He's on his father's throne. Jesus is the word of God. And Jesus has a sword that comes out of his mouth to slay God's enemies. And so when Jesus returns to heaven, he'll come down from God's throne. He's going to come down from the throne. Because notice here, he's on the throne of his father sitting with, with his father on heaven's throne. So he comes down from heaven's throne to the earth to slay the enemies of God with the sword of his mouth, right? Everyone got that? Everyone got that? Everyone got that, right? Jesus is the word of God, the father. He's on the throne of the father and he's gonna come off the throne of his father on a white horse with a sword from his mouth to slay God's enemies, right? Okay. Uh, let me read something. Tell you, tell me what this sounds like. Let me read something. And you guys on Discord, especially Daughter Christ, tell me what this sounds like. Who is this referring to? I'm not going to tell you where it's from. And those of you who already know, say nothing, please. Okay. Watch here. This is talking about the Exodus. The Pharaoh and God killing the firstborn. Okay. For though they had disbelieved everything because of their magic arts, the magicians deceived the Egyptians into not believing God because of their sorcery. Yet when their firstborn were destroyed, they acknowledged your people, meaning the Israelites, to be God's son, God's child. For while gentle silence covered all things, enveloped all things, and night in its swift course was not half gone. It was still night. Your all-powerful word, your all-powerful word, your almighty word, leapt from heaven 
from the royal throne, came out of heaven from the throne into the midst of the land that was doomed, a stern warrior carrying out the sharp sword of your authentic command and stood and filled all things with death. So your all-powerful word came out of the throne from heaven and he with his sword killed the firstborn of the Egyptians. And he was so huge in his appearance and his shape, he touched heaven while standing on the earth. Who's this referring to? Who's that referring to? The light of revelation, who is that? The light of revelation, who is that? Who's that all-powerful word? Stuck for Allah. I know you're kidding, daughter of Christ. Who's that all-powerful word that came out of the throne of God from heaven with a sword to slay the firstborn of the Egyptians, God's enemy? According to Revelation 19, 11, 16, who is that? But folks, that's the Apocrypha. That's the book of wisdom of Solomon, chapter 18, verses 13 and 16. That's the Apocrypha. The Book of Wisdom, chapter 18, verses 13 to 16. Here is the link. Go read it for yourself. Wow. There it goes. Did you catch it? Did you see these two amazing sections from the Book of Wisdom of Solomon? A section that described in detail... The death of God's son, who was righteous, whom the people hated because he exposed their hypocrisy and spoke against their traditions. And they put him to test by seeing if he'll remain meek, by torturing him. And do you see this other section that the author of the wisdom of Solomon knew of the all-powerful word of God, distinct from God, with God on the throne, who would come down and slay God's enemies with the sword. He knew all this. I don't know why. See, again, Alzheimer's disease is kicking in. I said wisdom of Solomon 18 verses 13 and 16. And this brother gave me 16 to 18. Protestant brother, I'm really getting scared for you. Can we send you some medication, bro? Now, let me give you another one. From the New Testament. Okay. From the New Testament. John 10, 22. John 10, 22, from the New Testament. See, I'm now showing you examples that strongly suggest the Apocrypha Scripture. Okay. John 10, 22. Okay. And it was at Jerusalem, the Feast of Dedication, and it was winter. Now, if you want to know who was there, let's go to John 10, 21 and 22. So we see what's the relevance. John 10, 21, 22. Why is John mentioning the Feast of Dedication and that it took place in winter? What's the relevance? Okay. Let's post John 10, 21, 22. Others said, these are not the words of him that hath a devil. Can a devil open the eyes of the blind? So it's not about Jesus, right? 21 says it's about Jesus. So who was at Jerusalem in the winter to celebrate the Feast of Dedication? And if you read 23 down, Jesus, right? Right? Jesus, right? Okay. You know, folks, click on that link. The NIV has a note. Here's the note for the NIV. What is the Feast of Dedication? Here it is. Hanukkah. Folks, Jesus was celebrating Hanukkah. Jesus went to Jerusalem. Notice, that's why it says winter. Because when does Hanukkah fall? Winter, December. Jesus, our Lord, celebrated Hanukkah. But folks... Hanukkah is not mentioned in your 39 Old Testament canon. Hanukkah is mentioned in the Jewish Apocrypha, the book of Maccabees, 1st and 2nd Maccabees, which is part of the Roman Catholic Old Testament, the Orthodox Old, Old, Old Testament, the Coptic Old Testament. Jesus is celebrating a feast 
whose history is recorded not in your 39 Old Testament books, but in these other Jewish books that Protestants and the Jews of today, and at the time of Muhammad, and even after the time of Christ, rejected. Yeah, Pedro, it's right there. I just gave it to you. Hanukkah. And you see why Pedro says winter? Because when does Hanukkah take place? In the winter. Do you guys want to be blown away with something? Does anyone know what the story of Hanukkah is? Around 167 BC, 167 years before Christ, a pagan ruler named Antiochus Epiphanes, 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 the king of Syria, came into Jerusalem, slaughtered thousands of Jews, took the temple, defiled it by slaughtering a pig on the altar and erecting an idol of Zeus. Are you with me there? That's the story of Hanukkah. 167 BC, this pagan king of Syria, ruler, dared to defy the God of the Jews, 167 BC, and they said it was around December, entered Jerusalem, slaughtered Jews by the thousands, took the temple, defiled it by slaughtering a pig on the altar, a pig, mind you, and erecting an idol of Zeus. And on top of that, he claimed to be divine. He claimed to be divine. About two years later, in 167, 65 BC, a Jewish family called the Maccabean family, Judas Maccabees, his family, led a group of Jews and by the power of God, destroyed the army of Antiochus, reclaimed the temple and rededicated to God. And that's why it was called Hanukkah. They dedicated the temple to God again after it was defiled. And the tradition says that they had to burn the lamp in the temple, but they only had enough oil for one day. Miraculously, the oil of the lamp lasted how many days? Does anyone know? How many days? The oil was only enough for one day. But because of God's grace, it lasted eight days. That's where you get Hanukkah from. You with me there? Not three, it's eight. Again, we're going by memory, but it's it's eight. You can double check. Now, folks, can I ask you something? Where, where does this story come from? It's not in your 39 Old Testament books. It's in the Jewish Apocrypha, 1st and 2nd Maccabees. There's actually four books ascribed to Maccabees. 1st, 2nd, 3rd, and 4th Maccabees. These Jewish writings that the Catholics accept, they accept two of them. I believe the Roman Catholic Church, I'm sorry, I believe the Orthodox Churches accept four, right, Anna? And guess what, folks? Guess what, folks? Jesus honored this dedication. Jesus celebrated Hanukkah, giving his divine seal that this event is a miracle of God. It took place, and I was the God who was there helping the Maccabees conquer Antiochus and reclaim the temple for my glory. Because that temple was built for the glory of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And Jesus says, amen, this is a bona fide historical event, and this dedication should be celebrated, because Jesus celebrated it. John 10, 22, post it again. Let me give you the link. Here is NIV, NIV. Here's the link, their note to John 10, 22. Thank God for modern technology. Here you go. And then their note, let me show you the note. Their note right there in front of you got your eyes. Thank you, you posted it, brother. Hey, thank you, so you did it again. Okay, thanks, bro, for helping me. I didn't see it. So. Jesus 
celebrates Hanukkah. And you notice John says it's winter and Hanukkah takes place in winter, December. How many of you are blown away by the fact our Lord Jesus, the God-man, gives his seal of approval of a dedication honoring a group of Jewish warriors leading an army to overthrow a pagan king and his army that defiled the temple of God in Jerusalem. And they defeated him by the grace of Jesus because he is their God, whether they realize it or not, and reclaimed the temple and dedicated to God again. Antiochus, Antiochus, Epiphanes, Epiphanes the fourth. You want to be blown away even more? You want to be blown away even more? It's okay, Pedro. Pedro, what did Jesus say? If you seek him to know him and love him, he will then answer you by giving you wisdom and knowledge, understanding of his word, so you can know him and love him and obey him and honor him. And what does he do? Then he brings you that knowledge either just by reading the Bible directly or through teachers that he raises up to bless you. Right? But you want to hear what's astonishing, folks? If you read the literature of the Maccabees, Antiochus was a pagan, a human pagan, a wicked human pagan who dared to claim to be divine, a God-man, a God-man, right? Right? He dared to claim to be divine, a God-man. You know what's astonishing? In John 10, at Hanukkah, this is the chapter where Jesus claims to be the God-man. Isn't that astonishing? At the very feast, dedicated, commemorating God destroying and killing a wicked pagan king for thinking he's a divine human being, at that feast, Jesus says, He's no God-man. I am the God-man. It's at that feast where Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice, right? <clears throat> and they will follow me. And I give them everlasting life. They shall never perish, right? And no one can pluck them out of my hand. My father is greater than all. My father who's given them to me is greater than all. No one can pluck them out of my father's hand. I and my father, we are one. At this, the Jews picked up stones to stone him. And Jesus answered him, Many good works I've shown you from the Father. For which of these do you stone me? And they answered, For a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy. And because you, being a man, make yourself out to be God. John 10, 27 to 33. And that discussion took place at the eve of Hanukkah, which is the event commemorating God destroying a wicked, human, sinful, decrepit, pagan king for thinking he's a god and enabling the Jews to reclaim the temple for the worship of the true God. And at that feast, Jesus says, I am the God-man. Of all the occasions that Jesus could say, I am the God-man, he chose to say it at the very feast where the Jews remembered this wicked, even human, human pagan tyrant who thought he was God in the flesh, whom God struck dead for his blasphemy, but defiled the temple, and God delivered the temple out of his hand. At that feast, Jesus says, not him, I, I am truly the God-man. I am man, but I'm more than man. I am God in the flesh. Distinct from the Father, but one with Him. And He said it at Hanukkah of all occasions. Right? You understand how scandalized the Jews would have been? No, not here, John. Not, not here, Cloudy. No, that's John 8, man. Don't worry. There's part two of this tomorrow. Let me give you the link to my article from the Protestant perspective, okay? Because you're saying, what should we do? I'll get back to you tomorrow. 
because I can't finish this other part. I'm going to now give you, I'm giving you case why these books seem to be scripture. But even if you don't believe these books are scripture, you know what you learn today? Here's what you learn. You should be reading them because even if they're not scripture, they are still documents that tell us about the history of the Jews before the time of Christ and how God was preparing the Jews for the revelation of Jesus Christ, the God man. At the very least, if you don't believe their scripture, read it so you understand how they understood the Old Testament, how they interpret the Old Testament, the things they experienced, all of which was preparatory, preparing them for the coming of the God man. You with me there? Let me give you one more thing where there's one. Yeah, exactly, Lisa. The allergies here are bad, but I take it. Yeah, yeah, yeah you know it, right? Since March, it starts with me. Guys, let me uh, blow you away even more. I'm making a case for the Apocrypha being scripture. Tomorrow, I'm going to give you the other side. I'm just going to give you both sides. Not all the evidence. It's impossible for giving me all the evidence. But to whet your appetite. Because even if you end up not accepting the Apocrypha, you know what you learn? Don't denigrate the Jewish Apocrypha. Study it because it will only help you further understand the New Testament and how God was preparing the Jews for the revelation of the God-man. Let me there. I'm going to give you one more example that's really, you're going to like, no way, because you won't see it in the English. But here, let me show you. Hebrews 1, verse 3. Hebrews 1, verse 3. Are you ready? I'm going to have to get the Greek version now. Hold on. Hebrews 1, verse 3. I got to get the English version. Hold on. Before I read Hebrews, I got to get the, I'm sorry, the Greek text of wisdom. Hold on. Sorry about that. Ah, come on. Hold on, guys. Sorry about that. Let's read Hebrews 1.3. Let me show you something. Okay. Hebrews 1.3. And I'm going to do a part two tomorrow on the Apocrypha without any mention of Ahmad Didat. We can put him aside. Hebrews 1.3. I want you to see that word brightness. Do you see that Greek? It's not Greek. English word brightness. Who being the brightness of his glory. Do you see that word? Jesus is the brightness of God's glory. Do you see that word? Jesus is the brightness of God's glory. Brightness. Do you see it? Apo. The Greek word is apo gosma. Apo gosma. Let me get you the link to it. This word is only used once in the Greek New Testament. In the 27 books of the New Testament, this word only appears one time and here in Hebrews 1.3. You don't believe me. I mean, don't take my word for it here. Thank God for modern technology. Here you go. Apu Cosma. You don't even need to read Greek. You'll see it. Click here. Thank our brother first last who does read Greek. He posted it. Thank you. He beat me to it. Man, you beat me to it, bro. Go there. Do you see that word? You'll see it. Apo, apau, gazma. Apu Cosma. Apu Cosma. I'm trying to say how a Greek person would. Do you see it? Can you confirm? Can you confirm for me? That you see that Greek word brightness, it's apogasma. Can you see it? Why are you saying seven days, eight days? You're confusing me. Len, you, you're like everywhere. Everyone see it? Apogasma? Okay. Do you know, folks, this word does appear? In Jewish literature, not in the New Testament, but it appears in one place. Let me read it for you. I'm going to read it now. And I'll then give you the link and I'll show you where. For wisdom. Guys, pay attention. Let me know if I'm, I'm buffering. 
Because we're going to end it with this. Okay? Pay attention. For wisdom. For wisdom, which is the worker of all things, taught me. Notice the language about wisdom. Here, wisdom is described as an actual person. Actual person. That is divine. That is God. For wisdom, which is the worker of all things, taught me. For in her is an understanding. A Holy Spirit. Hmm. Holy Spirit. One only, manifold, subtle, lively, clear, undefiled, plain, not subject to hurt, loving the thing that is good, right? <clears throat> Quick, meaning alive, which cannot be let it, ready to do good, kind to man, steadfast, sure, free from care, having all power, wisdom is all powerful, overseeing all things, wisdom is omniscient, all power. Sees all things and going through all understanding, pure and most subtle, and enables and empowers righteous spirits, pure spirits. For wisdom is more moving than any motion. She passes and goes through all things by reason of her purity, pureness. She's all pure. Guys, pay attention. For she is the breath of the power of God. A pure influence flowing from the glory of the Almighty. Therefore, nothing defiled can touch her, contaminate her. For she is the brightness of the everlasting light. The unspotted mirror of the power of God and the image of, of His goodness. I'll come back to that. And her being one, she's but one, she can do all things. And remains in herself, she makes all things new. And in all ages, she enters into holy souls to make them wise. She makes them friends of God and prophets. For God loves none but him that dwells with wisdom. She is more beautiful than the sun, above all the order of stars. Being compared with the light, she is found before it. For after this comes night, but vice shall never conquer wisdom. Okay, let me read 26 again. For she is the brightness of everlasting light. This was wisdom of Solomon. Wisdom of Solomon, chapter 7, verses 22 to 30. Folks, you know what the word brightness is? No, it's not Proverbs. It's wisdom of Solomon, Thomas. Wisdom of Solomon, chapter 7, verses 22 to 30. Folks, can you guess what the word brightness is in the Greek? It's right there in the Greek. It's apogosma. The same word in Hebrews 1.3. Wisdom like Jesus is the apogosma of God's glory of his everlasting light. <whistles> the very word that appears only one time in New Testament, Hebrews 1.3, appears here in Wisdom 7.26 to describe the wisdom of God as the brightness of his eternal light. I don't know if they do. Who cares, Lynn? Lynn, are you still on this? We went beyond Hanukkah. You're still here seven and eight days? Apogasma God, esti photos, idu, idu, idu. Apogasma God, estin. You said esti, so it's a movable noon. Photos, I do you, K, Kai, Esoptron, sorry. Skelidoton, taste to the you. Energeas, there goes the word energeia, where you get the energy and the essence. K, Kai, Icon, taste. Akotho, Tetos, Autu. Okay, did you guys understand what just happened to all of you? Hebrews 1.3 says Jesus is the brightness of God's glory, apogasma. That word apogasma only appears once in the New Testament in Hebrews 1.3, but also appears in Wisdom of Solomon and Wisdom 7.26 to describe God's wisdom as the brightness of his eternal light. Everyone get it? Even on Discord? Even Daughter of Christ? Everyone got it? 
Do you see how much these Jewish apocryphal sources have influenced the New Testament and the inspired writers? And why you need to know this literature to more properly understand the New Testament? Because it gives you a window into the history of the Jews, how they interpret the Old Testament, the events that took place in their lives, preparing for the coming of Jesus and his revelation. Now, with that said, tomorrow I'm going to show you some of the reasons why people used to reject the Apocrypha scripture, but still believe it has benefit and should be studied to more properly understand the background of the New Testament. But I'm going to do it tomorrow because you got a lot of meat today. A lot of meat. And I hope you save the links. We'll put them in the description box. And there's another article I want you to read. This one is must reading because I refute that pseudo fake Mohammedan scholar, Tim Winter, another agent of the devil who deserves no respect, but exposed for the glory of Christ, Abdul Hakim Murad, who also quoted Mark 13, 32, where Jesus says he doesn't know the day hour to try to show that Jesus isn't God. Here's my thorough refutation exposing him for being a fake scholar. And you can't help be a fake scholar because if you're a true scholar, there's no way you can believe in Muhammad. He's a fake, an agent of the devil. By the glory of Jesus, we re-expose re these fakes. There's the article. Save that too and study it. Lord willing, I will see you tomorrow again between 6 and 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, New York Time, not Canadian. Between 6 and 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, New York Time. And guys, pray for each other. Pray God will embolden you not to shame him. Don't despair. Don't panic. Because it's coming. They're going to tell you, stay home. But Jesus is alive. He's almighty. And he will show up if you trust him. Pray the Lord will protect us, that we glorify him. Pray more. Fast more. Study more. If they keep you home, take that as being in monastery. That you went to a monastery. And all you're going to do is spiritual exercises. Prayer. Fasting. Studying the word. Growing. And make sure you help those in need. And I pray I do that too and not be a hypocrite. If they're elderly, reach them. Show them, Jesus, that you're not afraid. You're not afraid because Christ is almighty over coronavirus. And he's with us and he's alive and he's real and he loves us. Pray for my daughters that God miraculously protects them, provides for them. And in Jesus' name, their mother repents. Michelle, repent so they can come to me. And Martin, be gone in Jesus' name. Remove him from my daughter's life. Pray for me to remain healthy. Holy, in love with the Lord, to keep writing, to keep studying, to keep teaching. Because now you see what I'm doing. You see, I'm not just sitting idle. By the grace of God, in full-time ministry, I'm studying, I'm researching, I'm writing. So I can give you all the wisdom that I can, that God has given me, so you can love Jesus more. Have no doubt he's risen, he's alive, and we can trust him and love him and live for him. Because if we die for him, then we will live with him. Let me end it with this. 2 Timothy 2, 11 to 13. Thank you. Enat Lehulu. I don't know how to pronounce your name. 2 Timothy 2, 11 to 13. Thank you, Anna. Pray, I finish the race. Pray, I finish with integrity. Pray, I live for the Lord, love the Lord, be holy, and die for his glory with integrity. And never shame him. And pray for the provision to come in. Because now that this is happening, people are going to panic and they're going to start coming back. But it's okay. The Lord provides. 2 Timothy 2, 11 to 13. Read with me. Well, I want you to read this because I'm going to end with this promise. God's promise to you. But it's conditional. Baruch Hashem Adonai Yeshua HaMashiach Ben Elohim. Okay. Read with me the promise of Christ, but it's conditional. Here's a faithful saying. It is a faithful saying. For if we be dead with him, if we die with him, we shall also live with him. 2 Timothy 2, 11 to 13. Right? If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. But if we deny him, he also will deny us. If we believe not, he will remain faithful. He cannot deny himself. Conditional. If you die with Christ, you will live with Christ. If you suffer for Christ... You'll reign with Christ. If you remain faithful, he's always faithful. But you deny him, he'll remain faithful, meaning to his promises. Whether you experience the blessing of those promises or not, because Christ will bless you. But if you turn away, 
Don't blame him when he doesn't bless you but punishes you because you turned away. He'll never turn away from you. We love you, Father, Holy Spirit. You live. You are almighty over coronavirus. Cover us with the blood of the Lamb, Jesus, and seal us by the Spirit to never deny you, but to love you more and die for you. Father, Holy Spirit, you are God. You alone. Christ, our Lord, come sooner than later. Sit upon the thrones of our hearts and upon the thrones of my daughter's hearts. We belong to you. We love you. In Jesus' name. Take care. Maran Atha, indeed.